actually knew that birthday song. I had no idea. I didn't. They started singing them like this is not what I was expecting. <laughs> All right. So to actually get on topic, what's the longest any of you have ever gone without eating? Right, the longest I've ever gone was 24 hours. Right. And most of us, at least in America, really have no idea what it actually means to truly be hungry, despite what your children may have said when they were younger. Right. Remember their kids? Mom, I'm so hungry. It's like, no, you're not. You just ate two hours ago. Right, here's a, a slightly unrelated fact. One in five children in America face hunger, while one in three face obesity. I don't know how to make sense of those two statistics, but they're both true. But anyway, right, so um, right, anybody ever actually done uh, like a fast before? Um, I've done several 24-hour fasts, and uh, it, there's, there's many reasons to do a fast. Um, there's the spiritual reasons for it, and it's kind of... The simplest way I can explain it is every time you're hungry, that's a reminder to pray. Right? That's, that's one way to look at it. There's also a lot of health benefits. There's been a number of studies that show that fasting is really good for your longevity. Like as in like every so often not eating for a certain period of time will actually make you live longer. It like resets your gut health and all that stuff that I don't understand about. Um, I've also done it for more of just like discipline Ish, like reasons as well, just to kind of force myself to do something challenging. And if I ever were in a situation where I weren't able to eat for a certain period of time, I would know I would get through it. Because uh, how it works is you you get hungry, and that only lasts about 30 minutes, and then it goes away. So you just know you just push through it for a few minutes. But I must say, like the longer you go, the more you look forward to that first meal. The first time I ever did, I, did, I, I decided I was going to go 24 hours without eating. So I just, I, I had dinner, and then I didn't eat anything until dinner the following day. So it's, it's really not that bad if you've ever done it before. But every, like, two hours or so, I would just get really hungry, and all I could think about was food. And then for dinner, Kirsten made, like, homemade bacon cheeseburgers. And when I finally had that meal after not eating for two hours, and I just like sunk my teeth into that, and it's just like the grease is just dripping off of my chin. And like, in, by the way, the key is you put your French fries underneath the burger, so it catches all the juice. It's it's much better that way, right? But that was the most satisfying meal I have ever had in my life. Right? The more you hunger after something, the more satisfying it is when you finally get it. If you go a long time without eating, it doesn't matter if it's dog food. That is going to be the most delicious meal you've ever had. <laughs> right, so the, the, more, the greater we hunger for something, the more satisfying it is when we finally get it. So we're going to jump right back into the Beatitudes. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Um, so I'm just going to read this right away. It says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So to hunger and thirst for something means to have a, a desire for something, right? And right, when you think of in terms of food, right, if you go a long time without food, right, it's literally to desire something like your life depends on it, right? That's the kind of hunger and thirst that we're talking about here. But obviously, this is not hunger and thirst for a bacon cheeseburger, as great as those are. This is something much better. It's righteousness. Now, righteousness is another one of those words that we don't really use outside of church very often in our culture. Maybe you hear somebody talk about being self-righteous. That's the only time I can think of, like, outside of a Christian context that I've heard the word righteousness be used on a regular basis. But the root word of righteousness is what? Right, right? So essentially, to be righteous means to be right with God, right? So you're, you have a right relationship with God. You are doing the right things. To kind of expand that a little bit more, it's to be com in complete accordance to all of God's commands and laws. However, there's a problem with this. Because if you believe what the Bible actually teaches and not just what your hippie neighbor might say or what you see on the news, but if you actually believe what the Bible teaches, you'll know that we are not righteous. 
Um, if you want to flip over to the book of Romans in chapter 3, um, I'm going to read, I'm going to skip around to a lot of verses, but we will come back to Romans. So if you want to keep your finger there, in Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul um, just starts listing a bunch of quotes from the Old Testament in the book of Psalms and some of the prophets. And he starts saying in chapter 3, verse 10, As it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. All right, so to me, that sounds pretty clear, right? No one is righteous. If you think that you're not included in that list, just read through it again. Right? There's, there's no room for, for any other interpretation. except None of us are righteous. None of us are in right standing with God. Um, the author Isaiah puts it a little differently in chapter 64, verse 6, when he says, We have all become like one who is unclean, referring to the Old Testament law, ceremonially unclean, not allowed to enter into the temple, that kind of stuff. Uh, right? And all of our righteous deeds are like polluted garments. Right? Some of you, if you have a different translation, it might say something like filthy rags. But the interesting thing about this verse is when you actually look at what was really written in the original Hebrew, that polluted garments or filthy rags is actually translated menstruation garments. Right? I've taught this to the teens before, and when I said that the first time, all of the girls go, ew, and all of the guys just look at me with this confused look like, I don't know what that means. Uh, right? So basically what Isaiah is saying is that your good deeds, when you try to do good things, it amounts to a dirty tampon. Right? That's, that's quite, the, quite the picture in your brain, isn't it? Right? And uh, you may be thinking, right, well, I'm not that bad. Right? I'm way better than that guy over there. Right? You, this, this can't really be what the Bible is saying. I'm not that bad of a person. Well, you know what? Compared to that guy, you might be a good person. Only, here's the issue. God does not judge us co by comparing us to that guy. God judges us by comparing us to himself. Right? And you may think that you are good, but compared to God, you will never be good enough. Right? We, in ourselves, right, our natural state, we have no righteousness of our own. And again, right, we, we got to think of the standard here, right? The Bible says, there, in the Old Testament, God says to the nation of Israel, like, over and over and over again, you are to be holy, for I am holy, right? Which means God's standard is himself, and God is perfect. And it doesn't matter how good you try to be, you will never be perfect. You ever wonder why in the Old Testament there's all these weird laws that, about, like, things that make you unclean, like touching any kind of bodily fluid or blood or any dead animal? All of these things make you ceremonially unclean, and you have to go through this process of, like, washing and cleansing yourself before you can be made clean again. The point of that is not to say that touching bodily fluid or blood or anything like that is a sin— but it's a constant reminder that us, in our, our natural selves, our human nature, is not good enough to get to God. There is a separation between us and God. And again, it doesn't matter how good you are compared to somebody else. Somebody else is not the standard. God is the standard. And so in ourselves, we are not righteous. Right, so that brings up the million-dollar question. Why would the Bible tell us to hunger and thirst for righteousness if we don't have any, right? How can we be righteous when it clearly says that we are not righteous, right? And so the answer to that is twofold. Um, and so the, the first part of the answer is what's called the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's a really big theological term because theologians like to make up really weird words to describe things. Um, but imputed simply means to put into or given to, right? And so we first have to understand that we are not righteous, but Jesus is. Jesus came down and he did what we could not do. Jesus lived a perfectly sinless life. Um, and I'll prove it to you. First Peter 2, 2, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 
1 John 3, 5. For you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Hebrews, 5, or, sorry, Hebrews 4, 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Just think about that. Jesus faced every temptation that you do, but he was able to say no to all of them. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? So Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. He lived just like you and me, but he never messed up. He never did anything wrong. He fulfilled the entire law. Right? And when we think, about, I'm a good person, well, just think of the Ten Commandments. None of us have kept the Ten Commandments. Even Jesus himself would go on to say in the, the Sermon on the Mount, right? You've heard it say, don't commit murder. We're like, okay, well, I've never killed anybody. That's an easy one. But then he says, right, if you have ever hated someone, you have committed murder in your heart, right? Don't commit adultery. But if you have ever lusted after someone, then you have committed adultery in your heart. And then there's 603 commandments after that. Jesus kept all of them and did what we could not do. Jesus was righteous. Jesus was perfect, and we are not. Right? And so the imputed righteousness means that God gives us the righteousness of Jesus. Uh, so if you're still in the book of Romans, just flip over to chapter 4, um, and I want to read several verses out of here, starting in verse 1. Um, and so Paul is going to use the example of Abraham from the Old Testament, not how, how Abraham was righteous, even though he had no righteousness of his own. Right? Uh, so Romans chapter 4, verse 1 says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified or made right with God by works, meaning the things that he did, he has something to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, or now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And the one who does not work, but believes in him who is justified, and the, or the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. If we skip ahead several verses down to verse 13, he says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the inheritance to the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but there was no, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Right, so the whole point of this Old Testament law, of all of these rules that God gave, again, there's 613 laws in the Old Testament. It was never about just simply do these things and you'll be okay. Right, because all of us failed. Again, when we look at what Jesus, when Jesus expands these, and it's not just about what you do, but it's about where your heart is as well. You have to have the right motivations and the right actions. But the whole point of the law is to show us that we can't do it. It teaches us that all of us mess up, right? It, and even the slightest mess up makes you less than perfect. Again, the standard is not the person next to you, because right? that's an easy standard, especially in, if you don't like that standard, sit next to somebody else, and then it becomes an easier standard, right? We, we are, our, our earthly brains, we, we, we look at what's around us and think, well, I'm not that bad. But the whole point of the law is to say that according to God's standards, none of us live up to it. None of us meet those standards. None of us are righteous in our own. But Abraham, who actually lived before the law was even given, it says that he, he believed and righteousness was counted to him. Right? Not because of what he did, but simply because he believed God. So as Christians, how do we gain righteousness? Well, the answer is that we believe that Jesus did it for us. We believe, we put our faith, our trust, our complete confidence in the idea that Jesus Christ came down and lived a completely sinless life. He did what we were incapable of doing. 
and then he died on the cross, paying the consequences for our sins, even though he had none of his own, and then he conquered death by, ri by rising from the dead on the third day. And when we put our faith in Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus is given to us. So as a Christian, when God looks at you, he no longer sees the things that you've done, but now he sees what Jesus did for you. There's a really cool picture of this in the book of Revelation. John talks about it, the, the final judgment. There's going to be books opened up. And one of those books is called the Lamb's Book of Life. And in that book is every person who has ever put their faith in Jesus. Right? If you are truly a Christian, if you have believed that Jesus died for your sins and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, your, book, your name is written inside of that book and it can never be taken out. And so at judgment, God opens up the book of life. And if your name is in that book, you go to heaven. Right? And when every person that is in that book, when God looks at you, he sees not what you've done, he sees what Jesus did. The other books doesn't actually have a name, but it, it says, I don't remember the exact wording of it, but it's basically all of the things that you've ever done, which means every sin that you have ever committed is listed in that book. That's got to be a really big book when you think about it, right? There's a lot of people that have done a lot of bad things, right? And so anyone whose name is not found in the Lamb's Book of Life, then they turn to the second book, and we go through that. And God looks through, and he sees everything that you have ever done, and that is what you are judged on, right? So you can either be judged on everything you've done, or by faith— you can be judged on what Jesus did for you, right? That's what it means to truly be righteous. To hunger and thirst for righteousness, first and foremost, is realizing that Jesus' righteousness is the only thing that counts. And so we put our faith in Jesus, and then we are forgiven of all of our unrighteousness. So, First, we have to hunger and thirst for the imputed or given righteousness of Jesus, right? It's, it's grace. It's a free gift. It's given to us simply on the fact that we believe that Jesus did this on our behalf. And then the second part is, right, our own righteousness, right? So first we chase after the righteousness of Jesus, and then we chase after our own. But again, I said that none of us have any in our own Right, on, in our own doing. Meaning, you cannot earn your way into heaven. There's no amount of good deeds that you can do that can make up for the bad deeds. But that doesn't mean that you're supposed to stop doing good deeds. Right? We are supposed to chase after our own righteousness, knowing that we're never going to make it, but we're still going to try, but we're not trusting in what we're doing. We're trusting in what God is doing. That's why um, in uh, James chapter 2, right, he says, faith without works is dead, right? So as a Christian, we are not saved by doing good things, but if you don't ever do good things, you're probably not a Christian because good works are the result of faith, right? They are, or a better way to put that, they are the evidence or the proof of faith. If you truly believe in Jesus— then you will want to do good things, right? When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love God, and then the second is love your neighbor. The way that you love God is by showing love to your neighbor, right? So we are supposed to do good things. We are supposed to be an example of God's love, show love to the people around us, show compassion, forgiveness, generosity. We're supposed to do acts of, right? Help little old ladies across the street, bring people things of cookies, go shovel somebody's driveway for them. Little things like that are a way that we can show love to the people around us. And in, in a way, we're showing love to God when we're serving other people because God made those people too, right? So our job as Christians is to do good things. We are supposed to love people, right? There comes a point where you can know everything about the Bible, but if you're not putting it into practice and you're not showing it by your love, then it's useless because knowledge that doesn't turn into service is useless, 
right? It has to start in our heads, but then it moves to our hearts, and then it's shown through our hands in how we treat other people. Right? So we, we're supposed to do good things, but we, we need to realize the order. Right? We're, we're not trusting in the things that we do. We're not trusting in how we act, but we're doing those things as a response. Our faith in the righteousness of Christ comes first, and then, because of what he did, then we do good things. Now, oftentimes, from the outside, this can, whether you get that right or get that backwards, that it can look the same. There's a lot of people who are very kind people who are trusting in that, right, if I do good things, then I'll make it into heaven, right? But that's not how it works. And on the outside, that can be very difficult for us to recognize that in somebody else. But the difference is often the motivation, right? There are a lot of people who do acts of kindness but are motivated by fear. Fear that if I mess up, then God is going to judge me. Or fear that if, if I don't do enough good things to outdo the bad things that I've done, that then I'm going to be judged by God. Right? But the true motive is, right, we're doing good things, we're showing love to people, and, but the motivation is thankfulness. Right? And moti- we're motivated because God has already given us the righteousness of Jesus, and now we're just trying to live a life that will live up to what he has given us. In the same way that I don't do nice things for my wife because I'm afraid that if I stop one day, she's going to leave me all of a sudden, right? I do them because she's my wife and I love her, right? I already have that relationship with her, and so therefore I want to please her. I want to make her happy, right? I want to make her life as nice as I possibly can. Again, not trying to earn her love, but because I've already got it and because she does so much for me, I want to do as much as I can back. Which, by the way, that's good marriage advice. Just always try to one-up each other in love. Not out of, again, not, not driven by fear, but simply because you love them. And my wife takes really good care of me, so I've got a lot of catching up to do. Uh, right, so, so again, the, <laughs> which, by the way, she made those scones, which were delicious. Uh, where was I at now? Now I'm off topic. <laughs> right, so our righteousness is a response to God's grace. So to hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? Just like if you've gone a really long time without a meal, right? That's all you can think about. When I went 24 hours with eating, by the end of that, nothing was like, I, I had no thoughts in my head except for a delicious cheeseburger, right? And that, that is the thing that at that moment that I wanted more than anything in my life. So to hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? You want nothing more in your life other than to be in a right state with God. But we have to realize that we can't do that on our own, but it is given to us as a gift from God because we believe in Jesus' righteousness. When God looks at you, if you have put your faith in Jesus, he no longer sees all of the terrible things that you've ever done, which means you no longer have to live in a life full of guilt and fear that someday you're going to get caught. Right? But you can live in the confidence of knowing that I have a right relationship with my God because of the works of Jesus. But then as a res- or, or the be- after that, now I want to live a life that is worthy of what Jesus did for me. I want to show love to the people around me. I want to do everything that God has commanded me. Right? So when we truly hunger and thirst for righteousness, then we will be satisfied. Just like, again, when you, you take a bite of that delicious burger after you haven't eaten in a very long time, right, and then you become what I like to call fat and happy, right? You just, right, you know that, that really good meal that just hit the spot, and now you're just so satisfied, and you just want to, like, take a nap on the couch, and everything is right in the world? Now imagine that same feeling for all of eternity, Right? That's, that's very hard for us to grasp because we get on average, what, maybe I think 85 years is the average life expectancy right now. Right? So think 85 years may seem like a long time, but when you think in terms of millions and billions of years that we will get to spend with God, that's the blink of an eye. Right? And we will be satisfied for all of eternity. In Psalm 37, verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire 
of your heart. Now, it's really easy to take that verse out of context and say, right, so if I love Jesus, then I'm going to get everything that I want, so God's going to give me a Lamborghini. It's not what that means, as much as I would love a Lamborghini, although I don't think I'd be able to drive it half the year up here anyway. Uh, right? When we truly delight ourselves in the Lord, when we, when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, the desire of your heart changes from worldly things like Lamborghinis, and the desire of your heart becomes God. Right? And so when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, what we want most no longer becomes the worldly things. It doesn't matter how much money we make and how much friends we have. Right? Well, the desire of our heart becomes God. And I guarantee you that if the most important thing in your life is a relationship with God, and you're doing it based on your faith in Jesus, you will get that. Guaranteed. Right? And that is the most satisfying thing that you can ever have in your life. Right? So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Right? When our entire life, life becomes pursuing righteousness, being in right standing with God, not based on what we're doing, but based on what Jesus did for us, and then living a life worth that, you will be truly satisfied. You will be truly content for all of eternity because you will get what you desire most, which is the righteousness of Jesus, and a relationship with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for, for your, your good love. Lord, we thank you that you are such a gracious God and that we don't deserve any of this. Right? I don't deserve to be up here this morning. None of us deserve to even be alive because you said that the, the penalty for sin is death. Right? And you have every right just to, to strike us down every time we do something wrong, but you are a loving God. You are a God of second chances. And we thank you that we don't have to be judged based on what we do. Right? I don't have to face the consequences for every mistake and every dumb decision I've ever made. But when you look at me, that you see the righteousness of Jesus instead of my own, because I have none. I pray for myself that I will live a life worthy of that, that I will not take your grace for granted. I will not just keep doing what I've always done, but I will strive to follow after you. And I pray that for every person in this room, that our lives will be about you and chasing after a right relationship with you. And we thank you that we are not judged on what we've done, but we are judged on what Jesus did for us. And I pray that if there's someone here who has not made that decision, that today will be that day and that they can have a relationship with you, not based on, on how they can earn it, but just based on the belief that Jesus did it for us. And I pray that we truly will be satisfied, that, that everything else in our lives, even, even the, the good things, they'll just, we'll realize that those are unimportant when, unless we have a relationship with you, and that you would just satisfy us in that. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.